As you can see, this is the welding seminar. And uh, I sure wish there were more people here, but the people that are here are in for a real treat uh, because uh, the, uh, the man you're about to hear is, uh, is a great speaker and uh, you will learn something, I guarantee it. I want to remind everybody to have their cell phones on silent if you haven't done that yet. And uh, our next speaker is truly an expert in his field and his field is welding. It's an honor to have him with us today. He's made presentations around the world and is uh, a recipient of the AISC Lifetime Achievement Award. He's authored many texts on welding and including the AISC Design Guide 21. Uh, he has appeared on uh, Modern Marvels in the History Channel as a welding expert. He has a BS degree in welding, a master's in material science, uh, he's the current chair of the AWS D1.1 Structural Welding Code Committee, which is the uh, welding code that we all operate under in our shops and in the field. Uh, he is uh, on the AISC Specification Committee, a uh, professional engineer, a CWI, and also he welds. He is a qualified welder. Now, on top of all these qualifications, he is an excellent and engaging speaker, and I'm sure you will see that in just a few minutes. Uh, do not be confused, even though his name is Dwayne Miller, uh, he is uh, not associated with Miller Electric. He is a Lincoln Electric man. And uh, I present to you, and I'm just glad to have him here, Dwayne Miller. Thank well, thank you for that introduction. I hope someday my mother can come and hear one of those introductions. She'd be impressed. Um, and I just turned on this microphone. I've got to tell you, I've got a little phobia about these things. <clears throat> I went to make a presentation one time, and, and the AV guy said, you're ready to go, and he clipped it on my shirt. Well, I assumed that meant ready to go except for flipping the switch. So I flipped the switch. Now, unknowingly, I turned it off rather than on. I made the whole presentation, nobody complained. Now, when the presentation was over, I clicked it off, which was really, I clicked it, which really meant I turned it on. And then I went to the restroom and broadcast that through the whole hotel. <laughs> so I have a little phobia about that. Uh, <clears throat> a little housekeeping detail you should be aware of. The uh, jump drives that you received. My presentation is actually called SEAA 2012 Miller. Okay, I should have put on a better title. That's what I did, it was just my file name. And so when you're looking for it, <clears throat> that's what it is on the, on the program. Uh, all right, new welding requirements for steel erectors. Now folks, you can do anything you want over there, but I'm gonna kind of assume my audience is over here and kind of work off of this screen so uh, you can do whatever you'd like. Uh, I guess I need to first start by defining new. Now you say, well, of course, new is new. Well, how new is new? And more importantly, some of the things I'm going to be discussing with you were codified in 2010. <clears throat> now that sounds like it's two years old, and I'm not sure two years old is new, but in fact, some of you haven't seen this on your job sites yet for a reason that I think is pretty obvious. You're making a building to a set of drawings. <clears throat> Those drawings were developed under some kind of building code that usually a state uh, jurisdiction has adopted. Now the state uh, usually cites an edition of the International Building Code, and the IBC in turn cites an edition of AISC, which then in turn cites D1.1. And so you're doing work to D1.1, but what edition are you dealing with? Now, the next illustration is fictitious, but let's assume that you have a project, uh, and the drawings might have been made in 2010, but it's only now hitting the job site that you're dealing with. And when those plans were drawn up in 2010, they might have been based upon the 2008 uh, uh, specifications from the state. And in 2008, perhaps they cited 2006 IBC. Now, if it was 2006 IBC, that referenced 2005 AISC. And 2005 AISC was based upon 2004 D1.1. 
So all of a sudden, a project we're doing in 2012 might be based upon 2004 uh, D1.1. And that winds up being an important issue because as I discussed new, again, some of these issues are things that you haven't seen yet. And I dare say, and I'm gonna write kind of a big check here, some of you have the edge on your competition here because I'm going to be sharing things with you that you're gonna see down the road and you ought to start getting prepared for right now. So that when you bid this work and you're dealing with the general contractors and you're building, uh, dealing with the building officials, you're up to speed with these requirements. So that's my promise to you, and we're going to start taking a look then at the various codes that might be on your bookshelf that you have to work with. And of course, we've already heard about D1.1, the structural welding code for steel. Some of you do bridge work, D1.5. D1.8 is on the seismic welding supplement. And then on the AISC side, we have 360, that came out new in 2010. 341, the seismic provisions. 358, the pre-qualified connection details. Uh, those came out in 09. And then CEM 2010. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about each of these standards and what changed. Now before we do that, I think it's appropriate that we have a safety moment, if you will. And I want to remind you about the availability of Z49.1. You can get this as a free download from the American Welding Society. We just had a presentation on legal. I would not want to be defending my company if I had a legal issue involving welding uh, safety problems and I didn't have a copy of this anywhere in the archives of the company. You get that from AWS. This is welding safety A to Z. It addresses all kinds of issues, starting with handling of pressurized gas cylinders, handling fuel gases that you use for cutting and preheating, arc rays, welding fumes, electrical shock, fall protection, all those kinds of issues that are welding related, you ought to take a look at that very carefully. And while you're at the Welding uh, Society website, American Welding Society website, you might want to look at the fact sheets. Now these are one, two, three page consensus approved documents that take on a specific safety related issue. I think there's up to around 32 of them now and they discuss different issues that you face. Welding on galvanized, welding fumes. Maybe you heard about the contact lenses. Did you hear that? You weld with contact lenses that fuses to your eyeball? Well, it's not true. And there's a fact sheet that addresses that issue. Safe viewing distances for arcs. You might have that. How close can you be welding to the sidewalk that people can look at that arc? And do you need to protect the, the pedestrians from, from arc uh, flash? So those issues are there too. I encourage you to take a good hard look at that. My disclaimer, I'm not gonna cover every change in welding codes. I can't do that. I'm gonna hit on the major co uh, changes, the major ones that are applicable to you and your industry, but don't think this is comprehensive. I don't know about you, when I get a new book, I grab out some highlighters and I start saying I'm gonna highlight uh, the important changes. So figuratively, we're gonna be highlighting changes that have taken place in these codes over the years. And let's start with the granddaddy of them all, D1.1. Now that came out new in 2010. As we always do with AWS documents, if there's a change, the changes are shown with an underline. We try to outline in the forward the major changes. So when you get a new code and you wanna know what's changed, you can review the forward. It directs you to those major things that have changed within the body of the code. You find an underline and the underline will tell you that that has changed somewhat from the year before. Perhaps the biggest news in 2010 was the fact that we are now moving to a five year publication interval. Prior to that, we were on two years. So your D1.1 2010 should be applicable to 15 and then the next one will come out in the year 20. Major changes as it affects your business. Well, I've outlined these on here, a new table 3.8, clarification of backing requirements, new weld profile requirements, weld access hole requirements, provisions for shelf bars, and new requirements for backing in HSS. And incidentally, all these slides are on the jump drive, okay? So you can, uh, you have those for your review later on. Don't try to f f 
frantically write all this down. So let's start with this brand new table 3.8. I'm going to talk a little bit about pre-qualification, pre-qualified welding procedures. And dare I suggest some of you are going to learn a few things about how this is supposed to have been applied. I've seen a lot of misuse over the years. Let's go back to 2008. The black banner at the top tells me I'm dealing with an old code. I'll change that banner so you have a little visual uh, indication we're dealing with the new code. Now this is the 2008 code and this is an exact extraction of the uh, provisions in the code. You know when I put in those dots that means I'm not including all the sentences in between. And as I read through this, it says all pre-qualified WPSs to be used shall be prepared by the fa uh, manufacturer, fabricator, contractor as written pre-qualified WPSs and shall be available to those authorized to examine them. The welding parameters set forth in one through four of this sub clause shall be specified on the written WPS within the limitation of variables described in table 4.5 for each applicable process. Now you know that section or clause 3 deals with pre-qualified WPSs. And those WPSs are the ones that if you stay within a certain box, you can use those without performing any testing on the welding procedure. That doesn't preclude the need to qualify your welders. But in terms of the welding procedure, you can use that procedure without doing testing. That's all in section or clause 3. But notice that clause 3 directs us to a table in clause 4. Now clause 4 is on qualification. Do you see a little bit of a disconnect here? We're dealing with pre-qualification, but it sends us over to the qualification section. So the idea that was developed for 10 was to have a table 4.5 like table, but put it in pre-qualification back in cl uh, clause 3. Now this is not a change, it's a form of explanation. Remember it said the following 1 through 4 of this subclause. And there's 1 through 4. Changes in these parameters beyond those specified on the written WPS shall be considered essential variables. It shall require a new or revised pre-qualified WPS, and then we're given four. Now, over the years, some of my customers have misinterpreted that to say, those are the only four things that need to be listed on a WPS. That's a misunderstanding. These four things need to be listed within the limits shown on table 4.5. Let's go back and read that. The welding parameters set forth in 1 through 4 of this subclause shall be specified on the WPS within the limitation of variables described in Table 4.5. So to try to bring some clarity to this, let's take a good hard look at those variables. We have amperage, something that has a range. We have voltage, something that has a range. We have travel speed something that has a range, and finally we have shielding gas flow rates, something that has a range. So when we go to table 4.5, and this is out of the old code, this hasn't changed, it's been there for years, you notice these X's indicate where something is applicable. Let's take increase in filler metal strength, and we see an X there, no range is shown, if you have an increase, you've got to change your WPS to reflect that different um, strength level. You notice that we have a lot of things with X's, but we have some that show ranges. For example, the amperage is a change greater than 10%. The voltage, a change greater than 7%. The travel speed, a change greater than 10%. If I continue on, I see a change in the travel speed uh, here. Uh, excuse me, what's the difference here? Wire feed speed, I'm sorry. And then here we have travel speed. A change in gas flow rates. You see, these four variables are those that have ranges. And if you're within the range, you're OK. You leave that range, you need to write a new WPS. But you have to list all these variables on your WPS. So everything that's checked here, we have to cover somehow in our WPS. These four items happen to be those that have ranges. Okay, so that's 2008. We've been dealing with that. 
I'm changing the banner. Now let's go to 2010. You see the underline indicating that we have something new. I won't take the time to read all the words. Notice that we now reference table 3.8. Instead of going into section four, we're staying in three. And now we have a table that lists these issues. Now, once again, it talks about the variables uh, and the ranges shown. And we're gonna stick with table 3.8 so we don't have to go to four. I know you can't read it, I just want you to get a feel. There's table 3.8, it's two pages. And now let's blow that up a little bit. We have some general requirements. If an X is there, we have to show that on the WPS. You see a bunch of X's, but you also see some of these with ranges, like amperage and voltage and travel speed uh, uh, wire feed speed, travel speed, and gas flow rates are shown with ranges, just like we had before. So functionally, folks, this is not much of a change from what you should have been doing in the past. But in terms of how you do it, it's a little bit different. You're gonna stay in clause three. I think it's simpler. I think it's more straightforward. I think it's easier for the user. Let's now go into the issue of backing, and we're talking about steel backing and some clarification regarding backing requirements. I maintain this is not a technical change, it is a clarification of intent. In clause three, pre-qualification, pre-qualified CJP groove welds made from one side only, except for as loud for tubular structures, shall have steel backing. So for these pre-qualified single-sided CJP groove welds, we have a requirement for backing. Other backing materials such as listed in 510 may be used if qualified in accordance with clause four. So let's go back to section, well, let's look at our pre-qualified joint details. You've seen that, that backing is assumed to be steel. Now you could have other backing materials, copper, ceramic, uh, flux, but for the pre-qualified WPSs, single side, we're clarifying that that is steel backing. Now when I go back to clause five, that's the general fabrication requirements. It's applicable no matter what kind of WPS I have, pre-qualified or not, I'm into clause number five. And clause five tells me that I can back up the joint a variety of ways. Notice the use of the word may. It extends an, op uh, uh, an option. I may back up that joint. I can back it up with different kinds of materials, copper, flux, ceramic, uh, glass tape, ceramic, iron powder, or other materials. Again, notice the option of may be, uh, may be sealed. But if I use steel backing, then there are specific requirements that kick in for backing, and that's where we have a requirement for continuous backing and some other issues associated with the backing. Now, here's the summary statement. For single-sided CJP groove welds, if I'm using a pre-qualified WPS, I use steel backing. If I want to use other than steel backing, that would include open root joints, it would include ceramic backing, it would include copper backing, then I need to run a qualification test. Now folks, this is a particularly sig significant issue now for those of you who are doing seismic work. And how many of you have done work to D1.8? Okay, and some of you are doing it because you're in seismic zones. Some of you are doing it because we're finding D1.8 works pretty well for blast resistant structures. And so you're gonna see more and more D1.8. And you know D1.8 requires steel backing removal from certain kinds of joint details, right? Actually, the pre-qualified connection details require the backing removal. So if steel backing has to be removed, some erectors, reasonably, logically so, have started looking at these alternative kinds of backing. It's legitimate, but you need to run a qualification test. Let's go to new weld profile requirements. Folks, you need to know about this because this is giving you some latitude you didn't have in the past. It's made it more flexible, okay? Less rigorous if you want to, uh, to use that word. 2008, the old code. Notice that we say that groove weld shall be made with minimum face reinforcement. 
It goes on to say that if I'm in a butt or corner joint, it shall not exceed one-eighth of an inch. Now that's what we had in 2008. And here's the reinforcement. The code says it should be a minimum. But it also said in butt, here's our butt, here's our corner, it shall not exceed one-eighth of an inch. Now that's pretty straightforward and clear, but what do we do in a T-joint? Now incidentally, that is your beam to column connection in a moment uh, frame, right? And so the question is, does that R reinforcement apply to this situation? Do we have to limit that to one-eighth of an inch? Now the code does say it shall be a minimum. Is it desirable to limit it? To have a 90 degree intersection? Is that the intention behind this? Well, I think you can see the rhetorical nature of my question. That's actually desirable, but is it permissible? And that was the problem we were trying to fix. Now we had this 1 8 inch for corner joints, and I'm sure that's what my predecessors on the committee were thinking. But this is a corner joint, it happens to be the inside of a corner joint. Is that acceptable? Well, those are the problems that we wanted to fix. Now remember, we have this 1 8 inch, and I tried to draw this out semi-proportionately. There's 1 8 inch reinforcement on a 1 inch butt joint. Looks pretty good. There's 1 8 inch reinforcement on a quarter inch thick butt joint. Now see, you start seeing a little bit of a problem here, right? But here's the big problem. There's 1 8 inch on 4 inch thick steel. Now you know, we, we, we bought a lot of grinding wheels over the years to comply with this, haven't we? And what's the problem if you have a little extra reinforcement? We changed that in 2010. There's the underlying. The banner says it's 2010. We're back in Section 5, General Workmanship Requirements. And you notice that we have underlines here of a Table 5.9, a Table 5.10, and some other provisions. Let's start working through this. It says that all welds shall meet the visual acceptance criteria of Table 6.1, be free of cracks, overlaps, unacceptable profiles as exhibited in Table or in Figure 5.4. So now let's look at Figure 5.4, and I'll blow that up a little bit. Here we have a listing of butt joints. Notice that you have a listing of desirable profiles, acceptable profiles, and unacceptable profiles. And then we have a listing for inside corner joints. We didn't have that before. And you have the same desirable, acceptable, and unacceptable. Outside corner joints, groove welds in T joints, fillet welds in T inside corner and lap joints. Fillet welds in outside corner joints. And we now have some details for column splices where you use shelf bars and what kind of reinforcement is permitted for those. We took on the issue of uneven transitions, which you often have in your column splices, and what's acceptable and unacceptable for that. So that gets us through figure 5.4. Next, we want to look at table 5. I don't know what you want to do. I want to look at table 5.9, okay? So the next thing is table 5.9 and table 5.10. Now, these work together. Here's figure or table 5.9, and you notice you first look at a joint type, and we have two options. Uh, excuse me, we have several options, and then we have two weld types. So let's assume that I have a butt joint, and I'm making a groove weld. Now the intersection of those two say that I'm going to use figure 5-4-A to find an illustration, and I'm going to use schedule A to find the acceptance criteria. So sure enough, I go to the figure, and you've seen that already, but I have a butt joint with a groove weld, and then of course I want to go to schedule A, and schedule A shows up in table 5.10. 
And you notice that we have different schedules over here on the left-hand side. And if I blow that up, now I have Schedule A applicable to this particular joint, groove welds and butt joints. And now I have a varying acceptance limit for the maximum as a function of the thickness of the material. Before, remember, we had minimum not to exceed one-eighth of an inch. So now let's look at the application of that. The eighth inch on quarter inch stayed the same. The eighth inch on five-eighths would stay the same. The eighth inch on one inch would stay the same. But the eighth inch on four inch has gone to a quarter. Now this is more significant than maybe you realize right now. Because this is very common. You don't make those four inch wells like that. You make them like this. And if you're really careful, you see that there's a little underfill in the center, right? Now your friendly inspector is going to mark that up. And so you're going to re-weld it. And when you re-weld it, guess what you're going to do? You're going to exceed the eighth inch, right? And so then I have to grind it off, right? So instead of grinding this off, now we're saying you have an eighth of an inch. Excuse me, a quarter inch. Okay, I think much more reasonable, and that's one of the changes uh, that has come out in 10. I already previewed this a little bit. 2010 edition brought in provisions for shelf bars. You folks have been using these for years. D1.1 has been silent on this subject. We now have a definition of shelf bars. Shelf plates, bars, similar elements used to support the overflow of excess weld metal deposited in a horizontal groove weld joint. And so this is commonly used for column splice applications, particularly when uh, you have no transition in the thickness of that flange. And so now we have some provisions for what kind of materials are acceptable for use of, the, uh, of shelf bars, and then what you do with those afterwards. For example, shelf bars shall conform to the requirements of 510.1 through 510.5. I'm not going to read all of those to you. Shelf bars may be left in place only for statically loaded members. So for your traditional building members, you can leave those uh, uh, shelf bars in place, not unlike you've done with uh, backing bars and weld tabs. But in a similar spirit where we remove backing bars and tabs from cyclically loaded structures, this would not allow you to keep those in place. So for a, a cyclically loaded application, uh, you no doubt will be removing that. These provisions start getting into the chemistry of the bar and continuous bars, and it's essentially the same provisions that apply to steel backing. New weld access holes. I'm just going to touch on these. Your contractors, excuse me, fabricators uh, that are supplying you the steel would pay more attention to this. But we have some new requirements for the sizes of weld access holes. And I'm not going to take the time to read through all of this sort of thing, but we have some minimum height requirements, minimum length requirements, and then some uh, surface condition requirements. There's the minimum length, 1.5 T sub W, where T sub W is the web thickness, the height, a minimum of an inch, uh, 1.5 T sub W, and has to be over three-quarter inch, and it need not exceed two inches. If you have a... Um, Okay, so this is for rolled sections, and we pick up some extra requirements, including the radii on the, um, on the access hole, a requirement for a sloped or curved surface. And so here's the slope we're supposed to be looking for, rather than a 90-degree intersection. And then a minimum radius of 3 eighths of an inch or 3 quarter inch diameter. Now, this is something I do want you to be aware of. Again, I would think the people supplying steel to you should be aware of this. If you have galvanized sections, that weld access hole oops, is to be ground to bright metal prior to galvanizing. There have been a number of, of uh, incidences where cracking has occurred uh, coming out of the weld access hole area during the galvanizing process. It's a complicated issue, a lot of metallurgy in it, I'm not going to get into it. Grinding that thermally cut surface seems to be a good remedy for that. 
So be aware of that. It's now codified. It's, incidentally, it's been in AISC for some time, uh, and D1.1 is just picking up on that. New requirements for backing for HSS. Now, for those of you who make things out of square, rectangular, round backing, excuse me, round tubing, these new backing requirements are kind of important to us. Full length backing, underline is new. So the except as permitted below used to not be there. So let's see what we used to say. Steel backing shall be made continuous for the full length of the weld. All joints in the steel backing shall be CJP groove welded butt joints meeting the requirements of clause five of this code. Now the point behind this was that we wanted continuous backing for the length of the joint and this was the primary issue we were trying to avoid. Here we have a box section and the backing is not continuous for the length of the joint. Why do we want to avoid that? That creates a stress concentration that can be the point for fracture initiation, particularly if subject to cyclic loading. That's what we intended to do. Now when you join tubes together and you put backing in that tube, well, maybe you want to put in four pieces of steel or two C-shaped steels or even bend it out of one piece of steel, you end up with the seam, right? And so in the recent past, we've needed to weld up that seam. And so the committee took that under and said, do we need to do that? That's where the exception clause was introduced. And that's what we have now. For statically loaded applications, you're not gonna do this for cyclic. For statically loaded applications, Backing for welds at the end of closed sections, such as hollow structural sections, are permitted to be made from one or two pieces with unspliced discontinuities when the final, uh, following conditions are met. So we're talking about tubing, whether round, rectangular, or square. And we've already noted this is applicable to statically loaded applications. It's for the ends of the closed sections. It permits one or two pieces of material. So that's what we mean by the end of the member. And we can use one piece where you'd have a seam here. We can use two pieces as you have here. Now there are six rules that allow you to do this. The closed section has a nominal wall that doesn't exceed 5 eighths of an inch. The closed section outside perimeter does not exceed 64 inches. Now, is there anything magic that happens between 64 and 65 inches? No. What 64 inches does is it allows you to handle the largest square tube you can get under A500, a outside a dimension of 16 inches, okay? Because the people making offshore platforms with six foot diameters weren't going to go along with this. So we cut it off someplace, we cut it off at 64 inches. The backing is transverse to the longitudinal axis of the closed shape. We're not going to have segmented backing in longitudinal members. This is for the transverse splice. The interruption of the backing does not exceed a quarter inch. You have to get it within a quarter inch when you fit it up. The it looks like my highlighter's going bad. Yep, I'm running out of ink. Okay, let's get a new one. Oh, there we go. Okay, it's working again. The, the, what, if you're talking about codes for an hour, folks, you gotta do something to keep people interested. The weld with discon uh, discontinuous backing is not closer to the HSS diameter or major cross-section dimension from other types of connections. The interrupt in backing is not located in the corners. So let's try to make pictures of these. This is two pieces and the interruption is not on the corners. Five-eighths of an inch wall or less, perimeter of 64 inches or less, that gaps within a quarter inch. The interruption is not at the corners. You can't do that. I know it's easy. I know you'd like to. Why don't we let you do it? These corners really get stressed in the design of these members. The corners, the most critical part 
of this tubular construction. So we can't introduce those stress concentrators at the corner. We need to make sure that those splices are not closer to an intersection than the diameter of the tube uh, away. Why? Because the stresses in this bending area get very complicated. We want to make sure the stresses in that splice uh, are, are not so complex. Continuing on, for statically loaded box columns, we're mo moving away from tubes now. Box columns, pretty important for you, right? Discontinuous backing is permitted in the CJP groove welded corners at field splices and at the corner de uh, connection details. Discontinuous backing is permitted in other closed sections where approved by the engineer. Now here we have a box section, you're making a field splice, and this allows us to put in flat bars when you're making that splice, and that's acceptable for statically loaded applications. Now you've been doing that for years, we just really didn't ever say it was okay, now you clearly have permission to do that. So that's kind of a summary of what we changed that are major issues in 2010 D1.1 as it affects your business. Let's go to bridge. I know that we don't do a lot of field welding for bridges. A couple of things I want to highlight to you though. The biggest change was we combined table one and table, excuse me, four one and four two into one. I'll explain why that's significant in a moment. And then we had some, a lot of provisions to add in the new narrow gap electro slag uh, welding process. So let's talk about this merger of the two tables. The dark banner, we're going to go back to the previous edition. In the previous edition, you found your steels and filler metals listed in one of two tables. Table 1, table 4-1, and 4-2. In table 4-1, you had the lower strength steels, all less than 100 KSI. You had the welding processes of shielded metal arc welding, stick electrode, submerged arc, gas shielded flux core, and gas metal arc welding. That's what was listed in table 4.1. When I went to table 4.2, I included the higher, or the higher strength steels were included. You would also find that in addition to these welding processes, I picked up self shielded flux core, electro slag welding, and electro gas welding. If you want to look at it this way, Table 4.1 formally included the steels and processes that were viewed by some people as a little more foolproof. And Table 4.2 included those things that we thought we needed a little more attention to. Now what that meant was you qualified your welding procedures differently. If you had something listed in Table 4.1, you had four options. You could have pre-qualified SMAW procedures. You could qualify your procedures with maximum heat input. You could use the maximum minimum heat input, or you could use under 5.13 the production procedure method. If I was in table 4.2, I only had one option. I had to use this method called the production procedure method. Now that was in 2008 and the previous editions. In 2010, we changed that. We put everything in table 4.1. By doing that, all the steels and all the processes could be qualified with any of these four methods. Well, I said all, most of the steels and most of the, process, uh, the processes could be qualified that way. So let's look at the exceptions. You see the underline. The production procedure qualification method shall, mandatory, be used to qualify the following. SAW that uses active fluxes, electro slag and electro gas, non-standard groove well details, and the high strength steels. Now again, I know you don't do a lot of bridge work as erectors but these are some fairly substantial changes that give you more latitude and obviously this joint committee between ASHTO and AWS has decided that these are responsible changes. You have more flexibility. 
quickly on the electro slag. It showed up in different new annexes. Annex Q is a guide for the use of electro slag welding. This is not mandatory, it's a guide. If you're doing electro slag welding, even for a non bridge application, a very comprehensively well written guide. Very, ex very well written. Uh, should I tell you, I wrote it? Uh, <laughs> the committee voted on it. Uh, I think it's great, okay? Uh, I'm just not hu very humble. All right, uh, a guide for consumables. You'll probably not have to use that. That's more for the manufacturer's use, uh, manufacturers of the filler metals. And then guidelines for acceptance of electro slag. This is more for the states if they get into accepting other high deposition vertical welding processes. So there we go through the changes, major changes in D1.5. Now I want to go to D1.8, seismic welding code. You know, we have seismic concerns all across the country. This summer we had events on the East Coast, right? Excuse me, this summer, last summer, right? Uh, I also said that blast resistant design seems to be very nicely controlled with some of these seismic provisions. I won't get into all the engineering behind it, but think about it for just a moment. Blast and seismic have the following common events. You don't know when it's coming. When it does come, you really tax the structure, right? The loads are kind of unlimited and you don't know how the magnitudes. And when you're all done, it's okay to tear that thing down and start all over again as long as you didn't have a collapse, right? And so those common elements are really what's driving a lot of use of D1.8. And so you'll see that on a lot of government projects, uh, military facilities. Uh, I've seen it a lot in courtrooms, uh, uh, e emergency response facilities, hospitals, uh, uh, police stations, schools. So you're going to see more and more D1.8. Quickly, it looks like we're going to spend a lot of time on this. We won't. Most of the changes were for clarification. This came out in 09. The previous edition, which was the first edition, was 05. And uh, so most of this was after users used the code for a while, we found that we needed to clarify some things. We had some terminology changes, some new provisions for width and thick thickness transition. Importantly, some new welder identification rules that you should be aware of. And then we simplified, I think, the presentation of some diffusible hydrogen issues. So jumping into the terminology, terminology changes, uh, we used to call the lateral system the seismic load resisting system. Some of you have been around long enough that we used to call it the seismic force resisting system. And really smart people said, no, 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 we ought to be calling it the seismic load resisting system. All right, great, so we wrote it up, and they said, no, 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 we had it right before. <laughs> so now we're back to calling it the seismic force resisting system rather than the seismic load resisting system, and it's the same thing, all right? It's the same thing, it's just a change in terms. Some new provisions for width and thickness transitions. I won't take the time to read the words. We'll just look at some pictures here. And what we're talking, uh, I won't either, I, I will. When butt joints subject to tension are required to be tapered, transition shall be made in such a manner that the slope of the transition does not exceed one and two and a half. Now it's the engineer who's supposed to be telling us when we have butt joints subject to tension where tapered transitions are required. So the train starts with the engineer who identifies these connections where we need these transitions. And the transition could be in the uh, thickness of the part and it could be in the width of the part. And so we've now incorporated how that's accomplished in D1.8. This is the same as what you did for cyclically loaded structures under D1.1. Jumping down to these new welder identification rules, they show up in 613. Once again, on that little jump drive, you've got all of this, so you can review this on your own. In the past, we required that every joint be identified that was made by the welder for these seismic projects. So you could use a paint stick, you could use a stamp, you could do anything you wanted, but you had to identify each joint. We changed that and it now says the contractor shall establish and implement a means 
by which the welder's welding on each joint can be identified and associated with the specific joint. Stamps, if used, shall be of the low stress type. Now this means could be an electronic log, right? You establish a mean, a mean so that you can track who made what joints. But it need not be a physical mark on the steel anymore, which is what we required in 2005. We took the diffusible hydrogen requirements and put them in a table. The table is table 6.3. There's an example of table 6.3. You have the welding process, the applicable filler metal specification, the standard hydrogen test, and an optional hydrogen test. And instead of having two pages of paragraphs that spell this out, we have one simple chart, and I think charts are easier than reading through paragraphs. I hope you do too. So that's all the change there. It's in the presentation. Well, that takes us through D1.8. And now I'm ready to go and talk about AISC. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on 360, the 2010 edition. And the reason we're going to talk about that is the major changes or the welding related changes include this new chapter N. And it's going to change the way some of you do business. So that's kind of a big deal. I'll just touch on a little change in table J2.5. But we'll talk about N uh, at length. Now this is a brand new chapter. We didn't have a chapter N before. And chapter N is quality control and quality assurance. This chapter addresses minimum requirements for quality control and quality assurance and non-destructive testing for structural steel systems and steel elements of composite members for buildings and other structures. Now this is defining what the engineer in contract documents formally had to develop. And there's really two sides of this equation, folks. Chapter N is very much a compromise. It's a compromise between engineers and a compromise between contractors. You know, you have some projects where the engineer calls for no non-destructive testing. You also know you have projects where every joint's required to be tested non-destructively. And my colleagues in the engineering field often ask me the question, what's a good number? Should I inspect 10%? Should I inspect 20%? And of course, in today's society with the litigation, if you inspect 10% and you have a problem with 10%, the engineer is vulnerable, right? So the default is, well, let's do 100%. Now, if I do 100% UT and I miss something with UT that RT would have received, well, I'm a little bit vulnerable. So maybe I ought to do RT and UT. And since operators are a little bit... Uh, inconsistent with results. Maybe I should do RT twice and UT twice. You see where I'm going with this? It kind of, we kind of need a line in the sand somewhere. AISC has done that. They've said, this is what we're going to call as the minimum. Okay. That's what we find in N. This chapter addresses minimum requirements for quality control, quality assurance, and non-destructive testing. There's the outline of the various chapters in N. I don't need to take your time to read through those. Let's start looking at some details. The scope, quality control, QC, as specified in this chapter, shall be provided by the fabricator or erector. Quality assurance, as specified in this chapter, shall be provided by others uh, having jurisdiction, uh, excuse me, shall be provided by others when required by the authority having jurisdiction, applicable building code, purchaser, owner, engineer of record, and then it goes on to say that non-destructive testing shall be performed by the agency or firm responsible for quality assurance, except as permitted by a different section. So the NDT is being done by QA, but there are certain QC functions that fall under your domain. Then we have a user note. User notes are not mandatory, but this is AISC's approach to try to uh, encourage the use of Chapter N. The QA, QC requirements of Chapter N are considered adequate and encouraged for most steel structures excuse me, and are effective for most steel structures, and are strongly encouraged without modification. 
There may be cases where supplemental inspections are advisable. Additionally, where the contractor's quality control program has demonstrated the capacity to perform such tasks, this plan is assigned to QA, modification of the plan should be considered. It's not mandatory, it's user node, but it's kind of setting the stage so we understand the intention. Let's start jumping into the requirements that are going to apply to your organization. The fabricator and erector shall establish and maintain quality control procedures and perform inspections to ensure that the work is performed in accordance with this specification in the contract documents. Material identification procedures shall comply with the requirements of the Code of Standard Practice shall be monitored by the fabricator's quality control inspector. And then we have an enumerated list of things that would include the erector's QCI. Field welding, high strength bolting, uh, steel deck and head uh, uh, stud uh, placement, uh, field cut surfaces, field heating for straightening, and um, then the overall tolerances. Continuing on, inspection of welding, observation of the welding operations and visual inspection of in process and completed welds shall be the primary method to, conform, uh, to conform, confirm that the materials, procedures, and workmanship are in conformance with the construction documents. I agree with that. The best way to make sure we get a quality project is by doing good in process visual inspection and controlling the operations. Now, to emphasize that kind of idea, we have some checklists. And it gives us the inspection of welding and starts defining O as something that's an observed on a random basis and P performed on every single welded joint. And so that takes us to these tables. Now, there are tables for welding. There are also tables for bolting. I'm not permitted at Lincoln to talk about bolting, so I won't get into that. Uh, but we'll, we'll look at the welding tables. Uh, notice that we have a, a listing of things prior to welding, and we have the observes identified with O's. And that would include identification of material and welder identification system, fit up of groove welds, configuration and finish of access holes, fit up of fillet welds, and checking the welding equipment would be in the observe category. We also have some performs, making sure you have WPSs available, making sure that the manufacturer's certification for the welding consumables are available. Now that kind of makes sense, folks, right? You want to check that you have those things in place before you start making a lot of problems out in the field. I'm, I don't think we're into a record, it's just it has to be performed and the other is observed. You don't have to see that on every single joint, okay? Then we have the requirements outlined for quality control and the outlined uh, responsibilities for quality assurance. Now I showed you the before, uh, now we have during, uh, we have after, and you find the same kind of information. Now continuing on, now we get into maybe one of the more controversial parts of this, the mandatory NDT. For structures in risk category three and four, now that's an ASCE thing, and it's defined and actually reproduced in the, um, in the commentary. If you're into categories three or four, UT shall be performed by QA on all CJP groove welds subject to transversely applied tension in butt T corner joints and materials 5 16 thick or greater. If you happen to be in category 2, then this is 10% of the joints require that NDT. Uh, approved fabricators and erectors, and I think this is going to be something that will grow, and I hope that we can uh, see this applied. 
Quality assurance inspections, except NB NDT, may be waived when the work is performed by a fabrication shop or an erector approved by the authority uh, having jurisdiction to perform the work without QA. So this would allow your inspectors to do this work without the QA folks. Notice that it doesn't allow for NDT to be done that way. So that's gonna be a big deal. Some of you are going to think, I just got a new series of requirements dumped on me. Folks, I think I can find every one of these items in the checklist already in D1.1, that we should have been doing these things anyhow. So it's very much more visible, but I don't think you have new requirements. What's new is really the NDT, and that's gonna be uh, supplied by the QA agency and uh, it has defined that. The engineer can add to it, can subtract from it. Local authorities can add to it, can subtract from it. But now we have a line out there as a point of reference. Quickly on table J2.5, this is your table that gives you acceptable filler metals. There is a little change here in the CJP groove welds. It's actually this little block. It formerly said filler metal with a strength level equal to or less than matching, and it's now restricted to only 10 KSI less than matching. Uh, probably not a big deal for you, uh, but a couple of changes in that area. A footnote that explains that you take some exceptions to that. So that's what uh, the big welding related changes out of 360 uh, 2010. All right, now I need to go through uh, seismic very quickly. And seismic's really pretty simple. In terms of welding related issues, appendix W was eliminated, appendix X was eliminated. Now those appendices were in AISC until D1.8 was created. And so now if you look at the 05, excuse me, when you looked at 05, the old edition, you had W and it said this appendix provides details regarding welding and welding inspection and is included on an interim basis pending adoption of such criteria by AWS or other accrediting organization. So when D1.8 came out, this was no longer needed and W disappeared. Similarly, X was there pending this adoption by another organization. That's been dropped. The banner changes. Now I am into 2010, general or chapter uh, one, general provisions, a reference directly to D1.8. When I get into the seismic provisions and I'm looking at consumables for welding, Notice it takes me right to D1.8, the seismic welding supplement. When I'm looking for the criteria for demand critical welds, it takes me to D1.8. When I look at various welding joint requirements for fabrication and erection, once again, it takes me to D1.8. So our welding requirements are where they should be, they're in D1.8, and you won't need to be getting those kinds of issues out of the seismic welding provisions anymore. When it comes to inspection and non-destructive testing, once again, it takes us right to D1.8 to gain that information. All right, we're getting to the end, folks. CPRP connection pre-qualification. These are the pre-qualified connections for seismic applications. Without a lot of fanfare, a supplement was issued in 09 and uh, it's now in the seismic manual, uh, but um, you can get these uh, online. And there were several uh, changes. Again, I'm talking about the welding related changes here. We have four changes to the pre-qualified connections. Three of them are new pre-qualified connections. So let's work through those. This first one's very brief. This is the bolted in plate with a concrete slab. In the past, you couldn't use these with concrete slabs. Now you can. You probably don't care, and that's why I'm not gonna spend more time on that one, okay? Now the bolted flange plate, or the BFP moment connection, is this detail that's been added in. I'll tell you it's not my favorite connection, and I don't think you'll find it to be your favorite connection, but it is now pre-qualified. Now what this involves is field bolting, and a lot of shop welding. 
And so it's called a bolted flange plate connection, but it's really a bolted and welded connection. If we look through the details here, well, let's go back here. Let's go here. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, let's stay here. Bolted flange plate utilizes uh, plates welded to the column flanges and bolted to the beam flanges. Flange plates are welded to the column using a CJP groove weld. The flange uh, connections are made with high strength bolts. So that's the steel you get from the fabricator. These wings are welded or flags are welded in place with a shear tab, and then you're going to put the beam in there. I know you can't put a beam in that way, okay? But actually, that's a little bit of the problem. First, when these arrive, they're often bent. Secondly, well, think about loading it on a truck. It's kind of a pain, right? Then you need to control this tolerance very closely, right? And even if they get that right back at this point, angular distortion can be a problem. And then you do have to bring that in horizontally, and it has to fit in between. And you might be into shims, and there's a variety of problems. But if you can get all that, drop in your bolt, you're OK. All right, that's one new pre-qualified connection detail. Welded unreinforced flange welded web, or a WOOF W. Now, the Wolf W superficially looks like the traditional pre-qualified, excuse me, the traditional pre-Northridge moment connection. You've got a beam framing into a column. You don't have any dog bones. You don't have any reinforcement. It's where we were in the past. And if you bid it that way, you're going to learn an expensive lesson. There's a lot of deviations from the pre-Northridge connection detail on this. Let's look at some of those details. Special detailing associated with welds joining the beam flanges to the column flange. The welds joining the web to the column flange. The shape and finish of the weld access hole. It's all highlighted there. So let's go through those issues. Now first, you notice that we have a weld of the shear tab to the column. We have a CJP of the beam web to the column using the shear plate as a backing plate. We have a weld around the shear tab as well as the erection bolts. And of course, we're eventually going to have a field weld uh, of the uh, of flanges to the column. Now some of that detailing, and it shows up in the drawing, detail A. We have a minimum of a quarter, a maximum of a half inch between the end of the shear tab and the weld access hole. We have a little landing dimension here that needs to be maintained at a one inch minimum. We have the angle of the shear tab to the plate, 30 degrees plus or minus 10. We have a minimum dimension from the end of the shear plate to the end of the uh, or the uh, point of radius of the uh, weld access hole of two inches. These shear tabs are much bigger than you're accustomed to. We have a minimum hold, off, uh, hold back dimension here between the end of the weld and the weld access hole. And then we have this shear tab that has to be at least as thick as the web of the beam. So there's a lot of new detailing associated with that, not the least of which is the weld access hole geometry. Now this is going to be your steel supplier who has to deal with this, but in addition to providing access for welding, the detailing of this is, is important in order to get the seismic performance. And so you have this little land dimension, you have a minimum 20 degree angle in here, and Folks, that's wrong. It's maximum. It's maximum. I didn't fix that. Okay. Uh, 25 degrees is maximum. Uh, the dimensions of the radius, uh, a lot of detailing associated with the weld access hole. The last pre qualified connection I want to talk about is the Kaiser bolted bracket. Once again, it's called a bolted connection, but it also involves welding. These are big castings, not gray iron castings weldable steel castings. There's two ways these can be 
pre-qualified. You can weld the casting to the beam and bolt it in the field. You can bolt the casting uh, totally in the field. More likely it'll be bolted to the beam in the shop and then you'll have a bolted connection out in the field. Okay, so that's also pre-qualified uh, in the 2009 supplement. So there are the changes to the pre-qualified connection. Now that takes me to my last topic and that's CEM 2010. And just out of curiosity, how many of you have done work to CEM 2010? Really? How many know about this? You don't, well this was a big change in the welding world because CEM 2010 is Claire Elizabeth Miller and that's my granddaughter. And she was born in 2010 and that was a big deal to me and uh, so you need to remember her. All right, folks, that's the end of the presentation. I hope, thank you. I hope you learned a few things. Visit the Lincoln guys out here. I'll be hanging around there during the lunch hour and be happy to respond to any questions you might have. Thank you.